Hello to the world and greetings to all joining us and welcome. My name is Talvin Wilkes and I am truly honored to have the role as moderator to guide us through this conversation with an incredible group of impactful art leaders and theater practitioners based in St. Paul and Minneapolis, the Twin City. Our location is one of the key reasons I am getting feedback and I don't know why, I'm sorry. Okay, I am so sorry. There was feedbacks that I'm still getting from myself. So we're gonna start again. I'm getting a message that said, try again. So, but I still hear an echo of myself in the background. So I'm going to again. I am so sorry, there was feedbacks that I'm still getting from myself. So we're gonna start again. I'm getting a message that said try again. So but I still hear an echo. Okay. And I am so I'm going to again. Okay, I think I figured that out. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you for your patience. You now see that I am a technical Luddite, right? So I am, uh, this is great practice because I have to do this all semester long in the fall. So I hope you all are laughing with me and enjoying this particular moment uh, and really understanding how these incredible things happen and are meant to happen. So I'm gonna start again. And here's my greeting. Greetings to all joining us and welcome. My name is Talvin Wilkes, who's learning how to do these wonderful moderations in the system. And I am truly honored to have the role as moderator to guide us through this conversation with an incredible group of impactful art leaders and the theater practitioners based in St. Paul and Minneapolis, the Twin Cities. Our location is one of the key reasons why we are assembled for this conversation. The other is our various relationships as director, performer, producer, dramaturgs with the incredible playwright, Harrison David Rivers. And in celebrating his stunning work as one of the librettist lyricists for the world premiere of Broadbent, Arkansas, produced by the Transport Group in New York City in association with the Public Theater and currently streaming until August 16th. This conversation is one of a series of curated events live streaming in partnership with the musical. So those of you joining in for the specifics of this conversation, I highly encourage you to click on the link to view Broadbend Arkansas, which is streaming free of charge. And in lieu of a ticket price, the producers at Transport are encouraging you to make a donation to BTN, the Black Theater Network, the nation's preeminent, and this is my language, scholarly and advocacy group in support of the archiving, chronicling, promoting, developing, and celebrating the legacy, the present and future of Black theater and its global impact, and that is Black with a capital B, yes. So please watch and donate. And this panel, an invitation to streaming, is presented in collaboration with Theater La Dida, based here in Minneapolis who will continue the development of the musical in the fall and are planning its next production. So we are all very excited about that process. And they, on their website, are encouraging you to contribute to the theaters represented today, as well as Pillsbury House. And you can find links and information on their website. And with that, I would like to more formally and quickly introduce our illustrious panel. First and foremost, we have Harrison David Rivers, our beloved St. Paul-based playwright, a recent recipient of the Relentless Award, as well as fellowships from the Jerome and McKnight Foundations, among others. Major works include Sweet, and She Would Stand Like This, Look Upon Our Lowliness, a personal favorite of mine, This Bitter Earth, which I had the privilege of directing at Penumbra, 
five points and to let go and fall at Theater La Teda with productions and commissions far and wide, including the National Black Theater, the Movement Theater, Williamstown, About Face, and of course, Transport Group, the Public Theater Penumbra, and Theater La Teda. Theater La Teda is represented by Alyssa Adams, the Associate Artistic Director, who has a long career in developing new work in her roles as Director of New Play Development at the Children's Theater, Literary Manager Dramaturg at La Jolla Playhouse and Director of Playwright Services at the Playwright Center and as a frequent dramaturg at the Sundance Theater Lab. We are also honored to have Sarah Bellamy, the Artistic Director for Penumbra Theater Company, where in addition to her artistic leadership, she has designed several programs that engage patrons in critical thinking, dialogue, and action around issues of race and social justice. And just recently, today, released a new visioning plan for Penumbra as a center for racial healing, which I know she will talk about. And I encourage you to go to the website to discover the power of this vision firsthand. And last but not least, because there can be no least in this group, we have Austin Van, who is our legendary performer, director, and producer, widely represented on the board throughout the Twin Cities and nationally, including the companies represented here, as well as the Guthrie, Park Square, Ordway, Yellow Tree, and 10,000 Things, among others. All of those are our local folks, y'all. So she has also boldly stepped into the producing fray with the launching of a dynamic new theater company, New Dawn, instrumental in creating the brilliant, immediate, on the ground, traveling performance tribute to George Floyd, titled A Breath for George. So please, Google these folks, find their websites, and immerse yourself in the vibrancy of just a small example of the thrilling and thriving companies in the Twin Cities, as well as others, all worthy of your support in these times. Um, and just quickly, for me, for those who may not know, I will just simply say that uh, I've been in the Twin Cities, heading into my fifth year teaching at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and uh, become a bit of a fixture thanks to Penumbra Theater Company uh, with the opportunity to direct such wonderful works as Harrison's This Bitter Earth, two plays of Aoife Baeza's The Till Trilogy, The Ballad of Emmett Till and Benevolence, and most recently Penumbra's production of The White Card by Claudia Rankin, which I believe was the last production on the boards before the pandemic shut down. So there are, there are many other wonderful connections between this group uh, but our goal is to bring us into this present moment and from their various vantage points. So hello, everyone. I know that uh, we did receive a message from Sarah, who is a bit delayed inside of this conversation. So we will uh, welcome her uh, when she joins us into uh, this incredible fray. I cannot tell you how amazing it is to see all of your wonderful faces on my screen to just understand the importance of this network and the collective work that we uh, have been doing together. Um, but also this particular moment in um, sort of hearing your insight around what has been happening here in the Twin Cities, uh, sort of what was happening, I would say, pre and right at the moment of the pandemic shutdown then what subsequently followed after the you know, horrific murder of George Floyd by our police force, and then the galvanizing grassroots you know, immediate uh, response to that through protests uh, and connecting of course to the Black Lives Matters movement. And then also how did that uh, galvanize you to think about art, art practice? Uh, we'll first talk about ways you considered being inside of that immediate moment um, and then we'll advance from there. Of course, like I said, that could take five hours for all of us to get through that, but I would love for you uh, to just start briefly with maybe, you know, a short, you know, three to five minute hit on those particular ideas. Um, and I would love to start with you, Austin, be especially because of the uh, incredible traveling piece of Breath for George, which I think is, is just one of the uh, brilliant examples of immediate on the street, uh, witnessing an acknowledgement 
performativity as well as the collaborative network of presenters and traveling through neighborhoods in, in, in the understanding of the importance of this moment and artists inside of that moment. So okay. that's where I'd like to start. All right, well, thank you so much, Talvin. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Austin Van. I am the artistic director of New Dawn Theater Company here in the Twin Cities. We do work produced by women, uh, people of color, and um, our LGBTQ communities only. Anybody can be on the stage, but um, we want to make sure that we focus on those particular writers. I am also a ride or die Penumbra Company member since 19, doesn't matter. When I say 19, you know that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, so I have grown up at Penumbra and have always, um, uh, I was trained to uh, perform for social justice in, in, uh, with a heart for social justice. That's how I grew up. So it's a natural progression from uh, my grandmother teaching us to perform for her seniors at her clinic, to going uh, to being a, a member of Penumbra Theater, um, uh, to uh, blossoming into our company that is an extension of Penumbra Theater. Um, uh, when the pandemic hit, we had just finished a production of Skeleton Crew, a mm. co-production with Yellow Tree. And we were about to go right into um, a production of a play that I'd written about Josephine Baker with a, a co-production with the Guthrie at the Dowling. A pandemic hit and shut everything down, of course. Um, but because I have social justice in my veins and all mm -hmm. of my company members do, um, we decided to make sure that we reach out to people um, and touch them in their lives, say hi to our, to our audience um, be, because of uh, what the pandemic was doing to everyone. Um, feelings of, of despair and loneliness and feeling trapped. And so the least that we can do is say hi to everyone with a song or a, or a monologue or something. So we, we, we call it knock knock. We would just every week just say hi. One of the company members would say hi to someone in their home um, via our MailChimp, sing a song, do a monologue, and then um, suggest that they uh, reach out to an organization um, that was helping during the, the uh, pandemic. So that's what we can do. That's what we can do with our art. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trained to do. That's what we love to do with our art. Make sure that we are um, mobilizing people to take action because that's what our gifts are for is what we all think. Um, and then when I saw the look on that human's face as he had his neck on George, I mean, his, his knee on George Floyd's neck, um, I broke. I think the world broke. Um, we've known about Minnesota being um, have it, having really horrible cases of police brutality. I was actually married to a cop. So um, I understand it in a different way as well. But I couldn't, there was nothing in me that could just sit still and allow this to happen. So I called up um, my company members and all my friends and family and and Talvin and 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 everyone else and I said we've got to do something with our gifts. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be at the time, but I asked everyone to please submit something that spoke to that moment, how you felt with a song monologue. And so we asked our civil rights activists and we asked our artists and and we asked um, our neighbors and our community members to speak to it and we edited the film and we didn't know we didn't know what it was going to be or how we were going to do it because the, you know the theaters are closed down so we thought well maybe this will be like a truth truck and we projected on a white truck and we just ride around and um but the the um the soul it was a vehicle to make sure that we hand out pamphlets to those people who um are constantly saying they don't know what to do Inside of these pamphlets, we call them power pamphlets, where organizations where people can uh, mobilize and activate, roll up their sleeves and do something. Organizations that help eradicate racism, um, uh, 
either by uh, learning how to defund the police or supporting the families or supporting the community or um, helping to clean up the community because our city was burning. There were buildings that were just skeletons. Um, there were places that were just boarded up. People were afraid to come out of their homes, you know? And so um, for years and years and years, you know, people call Minnesota, Mississippi, because it's just a more beautiful, elegant way of uh, exercising people's rights to be racist. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's um, a different style of racism. Okay. And it often allows people to hide under the covers um, as, as black and brown people are constantly abused and killed. Um, so, we edited this video and we decided we were gonna project it on, on the side of uh, theater buildings because we couldn't get park permits or anything like that. And the theaters were, they welcomed us. Um, we had everything donated and volunteered. Um, all of the services, our projector, our screen, um, our tech crew, tech crew meaning two people <laughs> um, that came with us. And we were just supposed to um, show it from June 14th until June 21st with about two showings a day for a whole week. And we ended up showing it 31 times and ended about a week and a half ago. Um, what was beautiful about that was um, uh, one, a lot of people were um, clamoring to find out what we what they can do and I, I didn't realize that uh, when we showed um, when we had a viewing at the Guthrie twice there were about 300 white folks in the audiences each night and that gave us all hope to keep going because we were very tired of course you know um, uh, when we knew that we were speaking to the choir everyone was social distancing everyone was six feet away from each other with masks on. It was very beautiful. And we had hand sanitizers and, right. and gloves and all that stuff. Um, so we knew the audience that we were speaking to, but we, um, we uh, emboldened them to talk mm -hmm. to the people that are usually uh, deaf to these injustices and blind to these injustices. Um, and if you don't know how to speak to them, we would let them know, just give them these pamphlets. They can start someplace. Um, so, and what's, what's kind of unique about A Breath for George, that's what our film is called, is not only does it honor his life, but it, it, it tells stories of what it's like to live here for Black people in Minnesota, how mm -hmm. different it can be from the South and how it's supposed to be different from the North. My folks came from Tulsa and we know what Tulsa is, and we right. know what Tulsa was, we know about the massacre in Tulsa, but they came up here um, to, to have a better life in the North. And it just seems like it's a better life. It's pretty, very pretty, <laughs> but there's still sy systemic racism that is so deep and heavy. Um, so, um, did that answer your question? <laughs> that did. That did. That. Thank you. That brought brought us to that moment. Uh, it had such a resonance. It reached me, of course, uh, where I was sequestering in in Connecticut, and you invited me to participate. And you know, I could understand that important need for people to gather and and have conversations, even just by witnessing, um, and sort of to keep that moment alive uh, and vibrant. Uh, especially through uh, a kind of a type of art activism. So, you know, thank you for sharing, sh sharing that and congratulations to you and your new Don team for being a part of that impactful experience for this community and throughout neighborhoods around. You know? Thank you for your contribution. As I was saying to you earlier, um, you know, we, we as black folks, we grow up no, it's in our marrow to understand mm -hmm. and know what racism is to us and, and does to us. And we speak about it every day, all the time, every day, all the time. Um, so it's difficult for us to, to, to even think that people are ignorant to some of these injustices. It's really, it's, it's hard to imagine, but there are a lot of people. And after seeing 
um, a lot of our artist contribution, your contribution and your, um, your personal experience with racism, a lot of folks would come up and ask a lot of questions, yeah. which can be frustrating because you think, where have you been? Right. Um, but it's a great conversation to have when they, uh, you know, they're asking out of their heart, what can I do? I didn't know this. I didn't know that black men went through this. I didn't know that black women went through this. And so um, if we didn't have people will, it's hard to tell the stories. I had a lot of, uh, especially black men, they were um, really reluctant because they wanted, they were in so much pain. They were reluctant to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it took a lot because there was a lot of pain there how, and, and paralyzation. And so I appreciate you um, uh, stepping out and, and, and opening yourself up to tell your story, which is very painful because people need it and they need to hear it. Right. And I thank you for that. And the important thing about all of this is just how it has um, impacted all of our institutions and organizations. Sort of all, so many neighborhoods have uh, responded, were directly uh, sort of in support of, many theaters opened their doors to support the protest um, in the moment, found ways to, you know, make pantries, found ways to now become testing sites. So there's really something I think very incredibly galvanizing in the way uh, sort of a broad landscape of theater institutions are having to live into this moment. Uh, so Absolutely. that's my transition uh, to Alyssa, who is here representing Theater Latte Da, and importantly so because of being a long-term uh, supporter and collaborator with Harrison and supporting and producing his work, um, and even in the relationship to uh, Broadman, Arkansas, which you can talk about the future of it. But I would love for you to respond in that same way, uh, both personally and from the vantage point of Theater La Teda, uh, in sort of that quick pandemic impact, sort of, and then the subsequent uh, encounters uh, with this very important moment for uh, the Twin Cities. Thank you. Um, you know, in the, um, in the immediate, moment of the shutdown because of uh, the coronavirus. Um, we, uh, Theater La Teda had to uh, cancel the rest of its season. And as we looked toward what we would do in the upcoming year, which is really starting this September and carrying us through next June, which would have been our season, we pretty quickly pivoted to what we felt was going to be the very best use of our resources. And that was finding ways to, uh, to put money in the hands of our artists. Um, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, the Twin Cities has such an amazing community of artists who have made their lives here. Um, Austin was talking about how she literally grew up at Penumbra. Um, so there are artists whose entire um, artistic lives have been uh, um, supported in the Twin Cities. We have people like you and Harrison who have come to the Twin Cities. And um, it is, I think, important, so important to us at La Teda that we help artists, that we help playwrights, that we help actors, that we help directors in the most, on the, on the ground, just survive this time. Um, and so um, all of our resources that would have been spent on an upcoming producing season, um, we, have, have, um, we have turned into commissions for playwrights for new work. It will be channeled into workshops that will pay actors and directors to work with those playwrights. So really all of the resources of La Teda are going toward trying to help be a place that artists can continue to work and to offer some sustenance in this time because we want, we need this community of artists uh, to be here when this is over and uh, we feel like one of the things that we can do um, 
as as a company that has benefited so much from having the voices of those artists be a part of our work, that in this moment, um, to be able to offer uh, support is just felt pretty quickly to all of us that that was um, that that was where our focus needed to be. Mm -hmm. um, it's also about you know none of us know what the world is going to look like after this pandemic is over, um, if it will ever truly be over. Um, and so what are the stories that are going to resonate? What is the work that we're going to need? What are the stories that we're going to need to tell ourselves and need to grapple with? And I think um, as a company that has a long history of uh, doing both uh, musicals that are a part of the canon, but also supporting new musicals and new work. Um, it seemed very much a part of what our response should be to cast forward and to try to begin to lay the groundwork for what those stories would be mm -hmm. by supporting uh, commissioning artists and our playwrights and composers to begin to do that work, to begin to uh, see what stories they had inside of them that will carry us forward. Um, when George Floyd was murdered, um, you know, I, uh, I feel like we really got an example of why that investment is important. Um, Theater La Teda had already committed to being the, to, to producing the, to uh, having the second production of Broadbend Arkansas be a part of what would have been our upcoming season. Um, and we made that decision based on having seen it in New York last year. Um, and for those of you that have had a chance to stream it and watch the production, um, it is such a beautiful piece of musical theater in so many ways. Um, Ted Shen's beautiful compositions, uh, Ellen and Harrison's storytelling, the, the style of it, these monologues that, that bring you into the minds of these characters. Um, so it certainly, even when we saw it last year, we knew that it was a piece that um, we wanted to share with our audiences. But there was no way to prepare. <laughs> there was no way to know ahead of time that just how resonant the story that Harrison is telling in Broadbend would be for this community until George Floyd was murdered. And suddenly, that piece and the role that artists can play in helping a community know how to see an event in its full humanity, in its historical context, um, just seems so clear that Broadbend uh, is an example of what happens when artists have the opportunity to write the stories that are inside of them and how those stories can really become so much a part of uh, the dialogue that a community needs to engage in when something like this happens. So um, I think that it was just such a, a strong example for us of why this commitment to artists in this moment and into the stories that they tell feels like um, feels like the work that that Latte Da can do to help support our community of artists and to um, help to bring forward work that will help our community um, have the conversations that it needs to have and come to those conversations with again, a context that feels fuller and more humane than um, just what we see on the news or even what we may be seeing day to day in our own, our own community. Um, 
So that's 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 sort of where where we are right now. Um, Latte Da also because we we do own our own space um, and we were not able to produce in it uh, at the at the moment um, for many weeks um, after George Floyd's murder when uh, so many people had been displaced um, grocery stores were shut down um, homeless places where homeless people were living were no longer viable so we turned over the theater to become a distribution um, site for uh, supplies um, that were then distributed um, actually by many artists, took it upon themselves to help gather and then distribute um, diapers and food and sanitary wipes and all of those things out into the community. And um, we, we were very glad to have just a physical space that could help support those efforts. Thank you. I'm going to um, move to you, Harrison, as an artist representative and a voice, um, and that you've given us so many opportunities in this community to have these conversations. You know, of course, in my heart, this bitter earth, which really looked at um, the issues of activism inside of an interracial uh, queer couple navigating that landscape, um, but, what it did for us was to give us an opportunity of really having a specific Minneapolis St. Paul based idea and conversation around those issues, because you in that moment, um, you know, brought in Philando Castile and we had to reflect and recognize ourselves inside of that history, which I still feel, of course, we continue to live uh, through and inside of all the way through to this moment of unresolved. Uh, uh, injustice in our, our community. Um, so in the navigation of that, um, I'm gonna sort of open it up for you to uh, sort of jump in and reflect. Um, I love that you use the word reflect because I think that that's, um, that's been a lot of what I've been doing mm -hmm. um, both in the pandemic and since George Floyd's murder, just um, thinking about um, where I started and uh, what I've experienced on the way to where I am now. Um, I like Austin and I believe yourself, uh, I'm a company member of Penumbra, a very recent company member. And I remember being a young person in Manhattan, Kansas and reading um, August Wilson plays, reading about his life and learning that he spent time in St. Paul at Penumbra developing work and wanting desperately to be a part of that family um, and sort of like making a little bit of a vow, you know, one day I will be a Penumbra company member. And um, when I moved to the Twin Cities, one of my first emails was to Sarah um, at Penumbra to say, hi, I'm here. How can I be of service? Um, so I think that's interesting because I think the second email I sent was to Peter Rothstein at Theater La Teda to say, hi, I'm here, uh, I write musicals, or at least I want to write musicals, and how can I be of service? So I think that this time has been a time of reflection. It's also been a time of um, uh, of deepening relationships with, with theatrical homes, um, with places who have already shown a great amount of support for me and my work, um, and really just sort of seeing how can we go even deeper into those relationships? How can we create new work, further develop old work? How can we be in conversation about how we as a collaborative team can be responsive to this moment? Um, I have had the, the privilege of being a part of the Racial Healing Artist Initiative at Penumbra this, um, this summer. Uh, and I was paired with two incredible artists, Hannibal Lukumbe and Setu Jones, um, who just, sort of became these mentors that I wasn't looking for, who, whose words are now sort of guiding every day. And something that I think about every day is Hannibal saying to me, we must do the work and we must do the work with love. And of course there is grief, there is anger, there is sorrow, there are all of these things, but at the heart of it is love. Um, and I think that that's fueling my response in this moment. I think that's what, a breath for George is like, really it's about love. It's the love of that community coming together to tell those stories and to share it. They are sharing out of love 
Yes, there is education. Yes, there is a, a calling out. Yes, there is a hope for something better, but really it's about love. I mean, I think that's what Theater Latte does doing with their programming and the support of artists. All of it's about love. And I really think that that's the way forward. I think that love is the way forward and love doesn't have to be soft. It doesn't have to be gooey. It can be hard. It can be, um, and impactful. So I don't know if I'm actually answering any question at all. You, 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 you're stepping into this place and this space, which I appreciate and that's the way to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have not been able to be joined by uh, Sarah Bellamy, but I just want to represent, uh, you know, Penumbra in a space and sort of shift into the next phase of our conversation. And then we're going to uh, open it up to some of the questions that we've been receiving. Uh, but I had the privilege of being part of a pre-announcement of uh, Penumbra's uh, 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 new brand mission as a Center for Racial Healing. And I'm really encouraging our full audience to go to their website to really look at that new language. But I want to throw some of that language into this conversation. And there's just a section where it says our, our defining challenge. And this is on the website. And this is from the voice of Penumbra Theater Company. It says, our place in American theater will continue to be singular and critically important. And our community needs us to be more than a traditional arts organization. Minnesota harbors dangerous statistics regarding racial bias and discrimination for black Americans. We have among the highest rates of juvenile incarceration of youth of color in Hennepin County. We have the largest opportunity gap. We have a biased discriminatory employment and housing market. And as the world recently witnessed the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers uh, opened a deep and all too familiar wound born from generations of state sanctioned violence. We are uniquely positioned to help Minnesotans acknowledge these racist systems, to address the disparities within our state and attend to the trauma sustained from weathering such conditions. We have identified four core areas in which Penumbra has existing strategic partnerships to lend our support toward individual and systems, uh, and, and systems change education, criminal justice, health equity, and climate justice. Together, these sectors act as interlocking nets that snag black individuals and stymie growth for black communities. What is needed locally will benefit the greater nation as well. Our art-based programs will provide a local bomb and stand as a national beacon to affect cross-sector change for individuals and communities. So I just wanted to place Penumbra inside of that context, inside of what they are uh, living in at this moment, what they just released today. And I know that this has been programming that they have been developing for over at least the past a year and a half to two years. So there is such a, a, a resonance that I think is coming forth from all of you. And also I just wanted to, uh, to also say, for New Dawn, Austin, I mean, you, having been here in this community for a long time, just within the last two years, saw this opportunity for yet another new way of seeing and framing, you know, and bringing forth voices uh, from communities of color that, you know, were not necessarily represented, or shall we say, um, there's room for more stages, more opportunities, and really sort of more organizations. There's some dynamic organizations within our community that need the same level of support as well. You know, so, you know, the question I have at this time before we lose time is like, we also want to be clear that these challenges are present, you know, and we are sort of fighting for survival, fighting for, you know, sort of what the next two years for, three years for theater is going to be. But the question that I'd like for you all to address is how do we not make this, you know, a moment of just this moment? How do we, how do you imagine really engendering and bringing about systemic change? How do we really recognize and witness what that is and what that needs to be. Um, and could you just speak to that idea of, you know, new traditional, non-traditional <laughs> ideas 
inside of, you know, this landscape of, of theater, theater inside of our communities. Um, if that's a, a door opening for you, I would just love for you to think about that. What do we need? What's going to change? What do we need to change? Um, and what do you see as being stuck that really has to open up, not just for the Twin Cities, but, you know, across the nation? Well, I, I, think, I think black and brown people need to be at the table um, mm -hmm. making the decisions about almost everything, um, especially in our theater community. We don't have uh, many uh, black and brown artistic, uh, um, artistic directors. Um, I, was, I, I was hearing up, up until like 2018 that I was the first black something or other still in 2018. I was either the first black director at, at an organization, the first black female director at an organization, or the first black person in a particular role in a show. And that shouldn't be. I should never be the first black anything anymore. We need to be present in the administration. We need to be present backstage, not just on stage, entertaining people, but we have to make decisions about the programs, about programming, about the stories being told. More of our images need to be not just on stage, but we have to be able to make some important decisions and be in places of power. And that's what we're lacking. And it just can't be in February. You know, it has to be all year long. Um, I, I think I get sick and tired of people calling us minorities because we're not minor. That's one thing. But two, um, there's just more of us. There's so many of us. I believe in erasing that language <laughs> permanently as well. It's such a, oh such a categorical God. reductive idea that needs to be gone. You know, it's, I mean, we, we, we use it for policy, but enough already. It's, it's yes. irrelevant and we need to shift our language and talk specifically and understand sort of our broad base communities uh, throughout yes. this country. So uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm not going to get on a soapbox here, but thank you. No, no, <laughs> get on that soapbox. I'll build it for you. Go ahead. <laughs> but yeah, with, with, with uh, Penumbra's wellness center that's coming up it makes all the sense in the world because we have so much trauma in our marrow just every day there's trauma from uh years and 400 years of generational trauma that we carry with us that hasn't been healed generally individually sometimes maybe a little bit a little bit but we need to all everyone has to roll up their sleeves and start healing ourselves um, and that takes everybody's work. We can't just preach to the choir. Um, uh, white folks have to jump. They have to jump in. Our country is breaking. We're bursting at the seams and um, people in our culture, we say we can't go another further. That means this is it. One more thing. And, and, and we're just not gonna make it as a country. So we, we all have to heal. And that means opening up our ears. Uh, allowing space, taking space that we have a right to, to take, holding that space and making sure people come to the table and people contribute. Um, but that's, that's, it's going to have to be within our systems. And of course, we know the systems that need to be changed, but um, the organizations and corporations that, that we have to represent and, and we, there has to be space for us to be able to do that. Um, I know we're going to talk for a few more minutes, but I also want to reach out to our greater audience. Uh, we're about to step into a place where we will be answering questions that you post on uh, the chat line on YouTube. So go ahead, put those questions in. I'm reading them and we will begin to uh, approach them um, in a few minutes. Uh, I just want to continue sort of this response. And I also really want to sort of hear your, your reactions to sort of these national notions of solidarity that have been coming from theater organizations, but also the way that it has entered into, uh, you know, other fields, other aspects of industry, uh, you know, and really these, the, these, these notions of change and the question of accountability. That's the key one. Um, but if uh, uh, Alyssa or Harrison want, had any response to this, this idea of what, how do we not make this just a, you know, 
a singular moment of this time, how do we sort of really make true systemic change that's really going to potentially uproot the way we've been doing things? Or if you see yourself being part of that. <laughs> Alyssa, can you can la di da uproot? Do you need to uproot? What's you know, what's that sort of uh, transformational understanding? Um, access is one thing, transformation is another. Um, the, these are certainly questions that, that we are asking ourselves. Um, and I think that, you know, Theater Latte Dot is a white led organization. Um, we have had the privilege of working with uh, BIPOC artists, of telling their stories on stage, of having uh, the wealth of um, BIPOC talent, um, helping to uh, make Theater Latte Dot the place that it is. Um, and I think that the next step for us is, um, is not just creating those opportunities for um, artists to be a part of that work, but bringing them into the conversation about uh, what, that, what that programming is and what the role of La Teda can be in that community, in our community. Um, you know, I think one of the things that is that is beautiful about the Twin Cities as an artistic ecosystem is that there are uh, that there are theaters with um, with many different missions, um, and it it creates a I think a landscape of of um, different kinds of stories being told and of representation um, that I think is one of the things that's sort of a defining element of um, the Twin Cities. But there is absolutely work to con continue to do. Um, I think one of the, you know, I, I guess I always come back to I come back to that the artists are the people who will lead us into the future. And I, I don't need to step back from the responsibility of being a part of that. But um, I, I do believe that um, having the, creating a space for artists and having the humility to listen to what are the stories that the artists wanting to tell who are the people that they are wanting to gather around them to help them tell those stories um, is always going to be the place that we, that we lead from. And the thing I wanna lean into with what you just said, Alyssa, is that, yes, I think it's wonderful that we talk about you know, this incredible, incredible array of, of, of cultural theater institutions. Uh, you know, I'm gonna start naming names, help me, Pen, you know, Pangea, 10,000 Things. Uh, theater Moo, you know, Theater Moo, uh, Penumbra, you know, Penumbra, New Dawn. Right. But the important thing for me is how are we making sure that they all survive? Right, we talk about the importance of that as a landscape and as a community and as our sort of ecosystem, so to speak. But in this moment and in this time, I just feel we have to have a galvanizing effort with all of those institutions to make sure that everybody survives. Yeah. Uh, you Absolutely. know, because I've seen Absolutely. past waves of economic sort of challenge in which communities have invested in sort of larger institutions at the detriment of mid-size and smaller institutions with the promises of multiple stages uh, uh, experience and history I had in Seattle that I'll never forget. Uh, so <laughs> the point is, you know, may that not even be possible in this moment as we, you know, we move forward. Um, in you know, when I, when I think about, um, again, something that I think is, is true of so many of those, of those theaters that really lend themselves I, I would say are responsible for the richness of this, um, uh, the theatrical ecosystem of the Twin Cities. They were founded by artists, 
right? Whether it was Lou Bellamy and August Wilson founding Penumbra, whether it was um, um, uh, the, the artist that, that created Theater Moo, um, uh, Rick Shiomi creating Theater Moo, um, you know, there. And so I think, again, we've got to keep, yes, we've got to keep the institutions going, but for me, the, the main priority is keeping the artists alive because if the artists are alive and can find a home here and continue to make their home here, um, I think that uh, they, they will always be the ones uh, from which this community springs. Um, can we connect that? One, I'm sorry, I, think I just um, want to connect it to a question and then yeah. we'll come back around. It was just like, what can you tell young black artists who just graduated and just want to start their careers? Can I just, I'm, I'm gonna maybe let Harrison do that. I do just wanna say to Austin and Harrison and Talvin, I, I don't, that is, um, I don't want that to sound like that is on your backs to do the work, right? There is mm -hmm. also, an institutional responsibility yeah. to um, be true homes for you and to be structures that can support your ability to do your work. So um, call me out if it's sounding like I am saying, um, well, the artist will take care of it and you always find a way to survive because um, I do think that, I, I think that in many ways that is true, but I also understand um, that there is exhaustion that comes with feeling like it is always up to you to, to build and do the work. So I acknowledge that. And you wanted to say something, Austin, go, go ahead, put that oh, in and we can respond to the. Okay. The, the I'll be, I'll, I'll be quick. My mom says I'm yep. fast. No, go so, for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the work, the work that institutions have to do is in the hiring, um, making sure that your board represents the world, making sure that your administration represents the world and you see black and brown people. And like I said, on, not just on stage, but off stage in the crew everywhere. I think that's gonna help as well. And, and to, just to kind of piggyback off what you were saying, Alyssa, um, artists here, especially uh, before the pandemic and what I noticed and during the pandemic and then after George Floyd, I am noticing all of these smaller institutions as well getting together and making sure that we do collaboration so that we can take care of our artists. Um, and because you said that a lot of these institutions were founded by artists, we know that we should take care of our artists. I, our, our, our company follows the TTT model, which means that we pay our artists very well. If we have a flashlight and a, and a, a stick, we're gonna make sure that our artists are paid. But now we are, there is a coalition of us that are pushing the bigger institutions to make sure that, that there is full, fuller representation. Um, and like I said, not just in February. So that's how I think that we can survive, pulling our resources and making sure that when, when you get funding, you are including other organizations. You're including uh, uh, organizations that you want to work with so, so that you make sure that the organizations that are reaching out and making sure that there is um, inclusion uh, won't go by the wayside. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a little more, it's, to me, it's a little more simple than we're making it. And I think that one of the reasons why it's simple to me and, and not to these organizations that have a ton of money, Udon doesn't have a ton of money, so we don't have anything to lose. <laughs> so, but I think that folks, the bigger institutions are concerned about losing those, the, the, the patrons, and they forget that those same patrons are still going to Penumbra. Those same patrons were protesting in 1967 and 68 and 69 and 70. Those same people that look like they're blue haired were wrecking stuff. And so they'll be all right with change. It's your investors and it's your board members that you have to make sure that you can convince to, to make sure that you can can be who you really are as an organization, which hopefully is inclusive. 
but they'll be on board when when they feel it in the pockets. So, I I'm think that gonna, if we could I'm, go to that point with the two questions here that I do want us to address sure. is really about, um, of course, young black artists in this particular moment. But there's also this interesting one, which I think is important, in which it says, how can young artists with little experience who want to create social justice theater actively be a part of the change that we want to see happen uh, in large and potentially problematic theater companies? You know, there's that other landscape of yeah. access. Uh, I, I feel like I'm hearing a lot of my voice, but um, I, I would say just like literally, literally just do it. Like create a piece, stream the piece, get people together, um, take it to a theater, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So, so whatever you're thinking, you're feeling, write it down, create something. Now we, now we have to stream things. Now we have to put things on YouTube. So, so it's almost like you can write your own ticket, um, but reach out to organizations and say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I created. This is my voice about this particular issue. Can you do anything with this? Um, but people can start creating their own audiences as well. But um, don't be afraid to reach out to anyone in New Dawn, anyone at Penumbra, anyone at La Tida, anybody at TTT and say, this is what I have. They're not gonna be annoyed. They're not gonna be upset. They need content. <laughs> so make some. Anyone else want to I wanna second. I wanna second this idea of reaching out. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that I'm very good at. And I think it's because I'm like one generation from now. And I think that young people today are so resourceful and there's so much information out there. Reach out, find an email, find an Instagram account, message someone on Facebook, tell them what you need or what you think you might need. Um, even if you don't have anything at this point, just say, how can I help? How can I be a part? What role might you have for me? I think that's important. I think speaking to the larger question of, how, how you get started. I think you read, I think you read your Baldwin, I think you read your Walker, I think you read your Octavia Butler, I think you read your Dominique Moriso, I think you, re like you read, you, you root yourself um, in, in the canon, in this like black canon, in this- by The new canon. Right, you, 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 you root yourself in that, you get inspired by that, you know that, you know where you came from. And then I think that you write, you know, if you're a writer, you write. And it's, and it's not even about what you write, it's the fact that you are doing it. It's, the, it's working that muscle and it's developing a practice and a discipline. Commit your thoughts to the page. Um, and then again, reach out and, 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 and call on your elders, call on those who are at the same level as you who are doing things that you want to be a part of, let them know that you're ready to join. I think that that's, that's the way to start it. You gotta put yourself out there. If you all don't mind, may we go a few minutes over just to address maybe two more questions. And one I think is very important. It's framed in this way. How can educational institutions push for more equitable representation within the theater scene? But I think also in addition to that is how can theater communities impact on sort of educational institutions to also broaden and enhance um, sort of their training practices, their instruction, sort of what is that, you know, accountability and responsibility in both ways from the educational institutions into the field, the field in response to our institutions. I don't know that I have a lot to say about institutional practices outside of uh, material. So like mm -hmm. what materials are students exposed to? What, what materials mm -hmm. are made available to students of color, to other students within academic institutions? And mm -hmm. I will say that there is, I think, a direct pipeline to theaters and what theaters program and what theaters commission. And I think if we are deeply, as Alyssa said earlier, um, supporting our artists and allowing them to create work that they feel passionate about, mm -hmm. work that is not necessarily rooted in trauma or in, in like the past, but in the present, in, 
in, especially in my case, like black people who are living today, like I do feel like there's a dearth of material. So if theaters are investing in artists who are creating specific, intricate, deep material that then is filtered into regional theaters, academic institutions, um, I think it, I think it transforms the canon. It makes more materials available to students who perhaps have not had material to work with, who had to work with the Greeks and the Greeks only, or Shakespeare and Shakespeare only because there was no one else for them to embody, to interact with, to see themselves in. So as a playwright, I, I can speak to sort of, if the artist is given the chance to write something that is meaningful to them, that is deep and rich and detailed, um, then I do feel like that has a trickle down effect or a trickle across effect um, and brings more people in conversation with that work and with the people represented in that work. Yeah. And I would say being someone in the academy and in the profession, you know, the whole point of just intentional mindfulness about what those relationships are and how we're building those bridges uh, inside of those particular relationships um, in both directions. There are two more things that we can address before we say thank you all for rallying with us. One was an earlier question about, and this is of the moment, is how are you taking care of yourselves as artists during COVID? I'm, I am um, drinking a lot, just kidding. No, I am. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm actually, um, I'm meditating more. I'm, I'm writing. I'm trying to expand all, all of my skills. I'm reaching out to do more projects. I'm actually having students come to me and we're working um, cause, because I was able to work with some U, U of M students and they asked some of the same questions, which was, uh, which were, uh, how do I get involved? And I said, well, call me. And so they did. And so we're working together and expanding, expanding our gifts. Alex Clark. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then just, and just uh, allowing myself to see that there is beauty and, and, and hope, and there's still all of this. I, I'm excited. I'm super excited to see uh, how artists are becoming even more creative and expanding who they thought they were as artists. You didn't know that you had these tech skills. You didn't know that you could actually perform like this. You didn't know that you could write that. And so that, um, uh, you know, out, out of necessity uh, um, is blossoming all of these uh, wonderful gifts of people. And I think that we're gonna be more bionic uh, when we come out of this season, this time. So um, also cooking a lot. <laughs> good food, good, good, healthy food. Because when we come out of this, I want to be a beast. There you go. How about you, Alyssa? Uh, um, I, I will tell you that my, um, my source of joy is really comes from getting to interact with the artists that we are supporting in the next year at La Teda. And I think, um, just watching, watching their minds work, watching uh, how they are taking the resources that we can make available to them and making the most of it. Um, so I, 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 I think like Austin, um, I'm hoping that, and I think already starting to see the seeds of um, a chance to take this opportunity to think about things that we haven't had time to think about before, to maybe step into the first steps of a dream project that um, you haven't had the time to do, um, the chance to begin a relationship with a new artist or a new theater um, and to see where that goes. Um, I, I, I also hope that that's building um, a kind of bionic, root system that's going to uh, feed all of us as we go forward. So my joy, as it always is, comes from getting to um, getting to be around the work of artists and seeing what they're growing. Harrison? 
um, yeah, I think I'm just taking the time to reconnect with lots of people from my past and my present who I, who I almost never get to see. And I do feel like um, <laughs> the one benefit of Zoom, perhaps, uh, it's not my favorite medium, but I do, I do, I do love that, um, that we are using it. And, I, and I'm trying to use it to say hello to people um, who I haven't or don't usually say hello to. You know, we have our, every year we get together and say, hey, but it's nice to be able to see people on a more consistent basis and to, to know what's going on with them and to talk about how they're feeling about the present moment and to, to debate and to, uh, to cry together and to laugh together. And even if it's over Zoom, that feels significant. The world feels in some ways incredibly small right now, smaller than it even usually does. And there's something really, I think, beautiful um, about being able to reach out and, and touch the people that you, that you love. And this will be our closing contemplation. There was this wonderful question that asked, uh, how do we extend this conversation to a broader community, to those who are not already like-minded? Any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. The broad-based transformative coalition, right? So what can that be? I feel like, I feel like all of us are, are doing it. That's what yeah. I feel like. And maybe a way like, A Breath for George did that. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's continuing to do that. We're going to um, continue to offer it online um, to uh, educational institutions and more theaters and um, and as as to, to begin some training, I guess, for some some folks, uh, some staff folks in certain institutions to so they can start a discussion. Um, Will it have open access it, or just through institutions? Um, we're going to give people pass codes um, okay. and encourage them to donate to, to different organizations. Um, so that they can view it and discuss it. And we'll Zoom, we'll, I'll say words on a Zoom, we'll show the show, and then um, uh, we'll have a discussion afterward um, for people who are left with a lot of questions. Um, and I think that's important. And then they can go out and hopefully they'll touch more people. Um, but the idea is that, that someone touches someone else and we just keep that chain going. But I think that uh, discussions like this that are streamed are gonna um, uh, uh, allow people to really embolden people to open their mouths um, and, and not only express their questions, um, but also start discussion with um, other folks that uh, are hard to speak to or are hard of hearing in certain ways. Um, and I think content, people continuing to, to uh, offer content that starts dialogue, that starts conversation is important. And now we have, we have lots of mediums to do it. It's not just confined to, to a theater space, but it can just be all out there and we're seeing that it is. So I think if we continue to do that and continue to be creative about how we share, but we can't stop, that's for sure. We have to keep our foot on the gas. Um, and make sure that we, you know, take care of each other. And in theaters, keep talking to each other as well. You know, artists keep talking to each other and see how to collaborate so we reach a broad audience, a wider audience. We're very segregated here. We can be our, our artist community, our theater communities. You know, some people only go to the Ordway. Some people only go to Chanhassen. Um, and what we've found with uh, reach, reaching out and going to these different theaters with A Breath for George is that we're seeing people that we haven't seen before, you know, and they're seeing artists that they haven't seen before. And I think that, you know, just making sure that you do whatever you can to reach as many people as you can. And it's, it's becoming a little more easy these days, I think. Yeah, well, it feels like, Austin said several things. There's something about the the sort of de siloification you know, like this this willingness to to go where the people are, um, which makes me think of the Little Mermaid. But um, you know, to go <laughs> where people are and to take the message, to take the narrative, to take the story where where people are ready and or present to hear it, 
I think it's also about like the way in which you share that message. I think that um, there needs to be an authenticity an honesty and openness. I think that, I think it's harder to reach um, if our dukes are up, which I think is like, it's also hard not to have your dukes up, but I think if the, if the fists are lowered um, and if there's a willingness to engage, honestly, even if it might get messy, I think that like engagement is possible. And it feels like, um, like the work that New Dawn is doing is that they are going to the people and they are saying, come meet us. We've already, we are already here. So like we already did 95% of the work. All you have to do is do 5%. And like, I, I do feel like um, uh, that work is, should not always be on the artists, but I do think that if you have a collective of people and you are there together and you are able to encourage each other and you can do that work together, then I think that that work can be incredibly impactful. Alyssa? I would just I would just add, and this is this is a, a plug for the work that all of us do, um, including the transport group, uh, including transport group and the public theater and the fact of broadband, which is what brought us all together here. Which is that I believe that one of the ways that we continue to broaden who we're having this conversation with is investing in new work, right? Is investing in new stories. And uh, the next generation, this generation and the next generation of theater makers, because I think it is when we risk hearing, investing in, attending things that we don't know, right? We don't know what we're going to get when we walk in the door. And that's often the case with new work. Um, but it is, I think, those pieces that crack open something new and reveal the world in, uh, in the way that it is now. Um, and I think that that is um, fundamentally one of the things that theater can do and one of the reasons why uh, new work like Broadbend is, um, is absolutely crucial to continuing to broaden who we reach and what they hear. Thank you. You, you brought us full circle. I want to thank you all for joining us on this conversation. I want to thank our audience for sticking, it, sticking with us. Uh, we went 15 minutes, 12 minutes over, which is the 12 minute bumble that I had at the top. So, you know, we're actually on time. So uh, the, the big plea here is especially listening to these few voices today that we represent many and it's an incredible community and an incredible network. And as I said before, we all are fighting for survival, must survive in order to sustain and maintain this rich richness and also to think about an uprootedness and whether or not this can truly uh, be a sustainable transformative moment. So we encourage solidarity, we encourage change and we encourage accountability. So thank you all forging ahead. Thank you for hearing these institutions on the ground uh, in the Twin Cities. Thank you, Transport Company, Public Theater, uh, Latte Da, New Dawn, Penumbra, Harrison, and all of the incredible things that we are about to make together. Signing off.